Is the Antichrist a man, a specific king, a group of people, or the Pope? Depending on where you are in history, the answer has been all of the above. You may have heard the name, but here's the truth about the Antichrist. The Antichrist would seem to be tied inextricably to the Bible, so it's weird how little the Holy Book actually mentions him, if the Antichrist is a him at all, that is. The term Antichrist only appears four times in the Christian Bible, and all in the first two books of John. But John doesn't talk about one evil guy who's going to come at the end times. In his view, at the time he was writing, there had already been a number of Antichrists, and that includes every person who didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus does mention false messiahs and false prophets in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, but it's clear he's referring to more than one person, not a specific rival. And outside the context of the Bible, it's clear that early Christians didn't know much or care about an Antichrist. Well, he never used the word Antichrist. The idea of a single evil presence who would go against God comes from Daniel in the Old Testament. But Daniel had a specific person in mind, the ruler of Palestine, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He wasn't talking about a vague evil entity in the future, he was referring to a specific contemporary guy. But what about the book of Revelation? You may have heard that the Antichrist figures into the events of that text, but the beast in Revelation, one from the land and one from the sea, as well as the ominous number 666, were never meant to have anything to do with the Antichrist. These references all had to do with the Revelation author John of Patmos talking in allegory and code about the atrocities of the Roman Empire, not one single man. It wasn't until the year 950, almost a thousand years after the death of Jesus Christ, that someone wrote down just who exactly this Antichrist guy was going to be. That's when Gerbiga of Saxony, Queen Regent of France, asked a monk named Odso for a clarification on details about the Antichrist. The Bible didn't have specifics, and neither did other church writings. That meant the monk got to make up whatever he wanted, and his story spread across the Middle Ages. The letter he wrote to the queen was updated by other people who added their own ideas, but for hundreds of years, what the monk said about the Antichrist was gospel. Gerbiga was worried she was living in the last days and wanted to know what to be on the lookout for. The little book on the Antichrist was written in a popular style of the day following the life of a saint, or in this case, an anti-saint. Odso believed that the Antichrist wouldn't show up until the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, but in his telling, the figure would be one man. He'd be born a Jew in Babylon, and the devil would make him purely evil. His arrival would look a lot like the second coming of Christ. He would go to Jerusalem to minister, perform miracles, and rebuild the temple. After accruing many followers, he would persecute Christians for three and a half years. But then there would come good news. At that point, the real Christ would finally return and decisively defeat him. After Odso, the medieval idea of the Antichrist was mostly set, but the monk Joachim of Fiori came along in the 1100s and had his own material to add. Joachim was obsessed with the idea of the Antichrist. He became famous in his lifetime for being the go-to person for prophecies about the false savior. Other than John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, Joachim was probably the most important apocalyptic thinker ever. He saw the end times as being right around the corner, but according to Joachim, there wasn't going to be just one Antichrist, but rather a whole slew of them appearing over time. Some had already lived, like Nero, Muhammad, and Saladin. These were Antichrists more generally, considered opponents to Jesus, but despite their existence, there would still only be one truly evil Antichrist whose coming would signal the beginning of the end. Born in the image of the greatest power in the world, the desolate one. Desolate because his greatness was taken from him and he was cast down. Revelation tells the story of a man named Gog who would rise in the future as an enemy of Christians. Joaquin tied the final Antichrist to Gog using that name. After a thousand years, the book of Revelation and the concept of the Antichrist were finally connected. One other notable thing about Joachim's theories was that he didn't think the Antichrist would be Jewish. Instead, Joachim said that those who would hurt Christianity would come from inside the church. Martin Luther started as a monk who had some ideas of how the Catholic Church could improve. When he was ignored, he published his 95 Theses and effectively started his own version of Christianity. This marked the beginning of what we now call Protestantism. Following Luther's line in the sand, he became locked in a public struggle with the Catholic Pope. Conveniently for him, he discovered that the Antichrist was not one person, but rather the entire concept of the papacy. It is said that Luther didn't want to come to this conclusion, but that his hand was forced with what he saw as the excesses and missteps of the Church. When the Catholic Church refused to acknowledge the problem with indulgences, aka the practice of paying money in exchange for salvation, he felt that he had to label them as enemies to the faith. Luther came to believe that Catholicism, specifically the denomination's figurehead, was deliberately trying to undermine Christ. Luther also thought the Pope was trying to take Jesus' place by claiming to represent him. 
These things made the current pope, and indeed all the popes, Antichrist to Luther. Once Luther saw the Antichrist at work, he decided the end times were imminent and that his battle with the papacy was an apocalyptic one. Luther's views became popular. One historical item that demonstrates his thinking catching on with the public is the woodcut known as the Beautiful View. The bold and bawdy image shows the Antichrist Pope handing over a flaming indulgence to peasants who aren't having it, so much so that they are literally drawn farting in the Pope's general direction. After Martin Luther, people stopped thinking about the Antichrist being an individual for hundreds of years. A singular Antichrist became a thing of the past. Instead, the idea of certain concepts being Antichrist or against Christianity became the dominant way of thinking. It wasn't until about 1900 that the concept of the Antichrist came to refer once again to an individual figure. Protestants especially believed in the general concept of Antichrist specifically when it came to the papacy and Catholicism. Islam was sometimes referred to as being Antichrist as well. Protestants didn't see the end times as a fight against one person, but rather against all the people who didn't believe what they believed. What changed? Weirdly, philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche might be largely responsible for once again revising the public's concept of the Antichrist. In 1895, he published an anti-Christian book called The Antichrist, and the term re-entered the popular vernacular as a reference to one person. By the 1970s, Christians had generally come to accept the Antichrist as an individual once again. Jesus Christ is an important figure in Islam, so it makes sense that Islam has its own version of the Antichrist. For the Islamic version of the end times, al masih Dajjal is the ultimate bad guy. The deceiving Messiah doesn't appear in the Quran, but he does come up several times in the Hadith. The Hadith are a collection of sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, which are considered to be almost as important as the Quran. Unlike the Bible, the Hadith goes into minute detail about who this guy is, what he will look like, and where he will come from. In the Hadith, ad Dajjal is recorded as a plump one-eyed man with a ruddy face and curling hair. He is also branded with the Arabic letters spelling unbelief on his forehead. Much like the Christian version of the Antichrist, he is predicted to show up during times of chaos. He will travel to Jerusalem with his followers, perform miracles, and reign for either 40 days or 40 years, at which point Jesus Christ is expected to come back and save the day. Tradition states that ad Dajjal is a figure who is already on Earth. He just can't show himself yet. Some legends posit that he is on an island in the East Indies, and that sailors passing that place can hear the sound of beautiful music and dancing. Another version casts him as something of a prisoner waiting to be unleashed, saying he's bound to a rock on the island and depends on demons for food. The belief in the Antichrist and anti-Semitism have gone hand in hand forever, to the extent that it was considered a notable aberration when Joachim of Fiori said the Antichrist would not be a Jew. The assumption was that the Antichrist would be the demonic twin of Jesus, and since Jesus was Jewish, the Antichrist would be as well. This connection did not disappear in modern times. Protestant preachers especially liked to tout their anti-Semitic credentials when talking about the Antichrist. In 1999, Jerry Falwell faced public backlash for his assertion during the speech that not only was the Antichrist probably already alive, but that, in his words, of course he was Jewish. When called out for his remarks, Falwell tried to defend himself by saying he only thought the Antichrist was Jewish because Jesus himself was a Jew. Regardless, as we've already established, the Bible says nothing of the sort about the nature of the Antichrist. Not only has anti-Semitism been intertwined with the Antichrist, but the menacing figure has also been linked to homophobia as well. This goes back to the book of Daniel in the Bible. While Daniel doesn't say the actual word, people interpreted Daniel's talk of a single man who would defy God as being a reference to the Antichrist. This was despite the fact that Daniel was almost certainly talking about a specific ruler of Palestine. When writing about the individual, Daniel throws in this bit of information. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. It's that last bit that some people decided to fixate on. If the Antichrist isn't going to desire women, they figured, then he must be gay. Thus, being gay is Antichrist. Do you believe in the devil? You're they look like me. According to Religious Studies News, a publication by the American Academy of Religion, one TV evangelist said, Daniel indicates that the Antichrist will be a sexual pervert, most likely a homosexual. Another preacher opined, I do not believe that there is any question but that the Antichrist will be a homosexual. Yet another claim that the verbiage is clear in Daniel and that obviously the Antichrist will be gay. It's important to note that all this homophobia is based on one line of a text that was originally in a different language and localized differently by many translators. But for those who want to tie being gay to the evilest entity ever, that's apparently not important. Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 says, 
This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Historically, the beast, who wasn't connected with the Antichrist concept for a thousand years, most certainly represents the Roman Empire, and 666 is a well-known Jewish numerical code that was understood to refer to the Roman Emperor Nero. Nero was notorious for martyring early Christians, so there is nothing mystical or evil about the number. It's a reference to the much more mundane evil of one specific man. But try telling that to people with the phobia related to the irrational fear of the number 666. While most people with that fear are Christian, it affects those in other religions, and even no religion as well. The fear of 666 might present as something small, for example, if a purchase comes to $6.66. A person may feel compelled to grab something else to buy so the price changes. The fear of the number can affect people's lives, leading them to avoid the number at all costs, seeing it everywhere and associating it with bad luck. Some people see Antichrist everywhere. The number 666 in particular has been interpreted to reference things as varied as the emergence of barcodes on products, the UN, the EU, and even the WWW at the beginning of web addresses. In 1997, Procter & Gamble sued the Amway Corporation for allegedly spreading rumors that P&G was satanic and that it had hidden the number 666 in its logo. Other supposed Antichrist culprits have included the concept of feminism and the Susan B. Anthony dollar. In 2019, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church claimed smartphones were paving the way for the Antichrist. And of course, one of the biggest concerns for the Antichrist-minded over the years has been rock music. The old gods, the rightful masters, are jealous, watching mankind with a hatred that is as boundless as the stars. Entire books have been written on how rock and roll was made to lead kids astray. The Beatles were Antichrist. According to one book, the damage done by Pete Seeger alone was, quote, impossible to calculate. The lyrics of the Rolling Stones were satanic, and so on. In the 1980s, people who feared the Antichrist discovered backmasking. This was the idea that rock bands were putting secret messages in their music that people could only hear when the music was played backwards. Somehow, this idea was taken seriously. Politicians got involved with legislation introduced in California claiming that through backmasking, musicians, quote, manipulate our behavior without our knowledge or consent and turn us into disciples of the Antichrist. One witness said people only had to listen to Stairway to Heaven three times before the hidden messages made them worship Satan. Other states considered similar bills, and one was even introduced in Congress. Thankfully, none passed, and over the course of hundreds of years, no other prophecies of the Antichrist have yet come to pass either. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more messed up history videos about religious history and myths are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.